My name is Howard Rheingold. I do a lot of things. You can find out about them at Rheingold.com. I teach, I write, I make videos, I, I speak. But I think if you want to generalize, you could say that I try to understand where we are going with our technologies and communicate my understanding in whatever medium works for people. When did you start to use computers and uh, to use the internet? Well, I've been a freelance writer my entire life, and I spent some years alone in a room with a typewriter, and my research tools were a library card and a telephone. When personal computers came along, I, I got wind of this idea that you could use them to rewrite, to retype pages without having to type the whole thing again. You could just move type around on the screen. And so that led me to find Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which really was where the personal computer was, as we know it, was in, invented, and learned very quickly that these are, are more than typewriters. Uh, that these are machines to think with, and that they were going to become very much more powerful. So this was in the early 1980s. I wrote a book in 1983 and 1984 that was published in 1985 called Tools for Thought, about where the idea that you could use computers to think with came from. You know, computers in their early years were only for scientific computations and only for, for business data processing. The idea that a designer or a writer or a, an architect or a politician would be able to use computers. That was really an invention going back to uh, Douglas Engelbart in the early 1960s. So by the mid-1980s I was exploring the world online through BBS systems and Usenet and then a virtual community called The Well, which I, I wrote about in 1987. I wrote the first article about virtual communities in the Whole Earth uh, Review, and I published a book called The Virtual Community in 1992. So I was very involved in online culture when it became the internet in the early 1990s. And uh, yeah, you're, you talked about uh, the Gutenberg revolution or when it changed the society. And you also talked, talked about that there was the literacy of reading. So well, of course, the, the Chinese invented print centuries before Gutenberg, and so had the Koreans. Now, their language is ideographic, so it's, it's much more difficult than an alphabetic language. But I think that there were a lot of issues that were cultural and social that determined why print became so important in Europe and not so important in China. So there was the invention of the printing press, and originally an entrepreneurial venture, and originally to, began to print Bibles, but it was really 50 years later when Luther came along, and his objections to the church at that time were very widespread. In those 50 years, What print enabled was for alphabetic literacy to spread from an elite of a few thousand people. There were about 30,000 books in Europe in Gutenberg's time, all of them written by hand, to a significant portion of the population. There were about 30 million books in Europe by, Luth by Luther's time. And that meant that there were many, many more people who were able to read. So literate populations, whether you're talking about the original invention of, of writing in, in Samaria six or seven thousand years ago, or the invention of the, the alphabet a few thousand years later, or the invention of print, or the, the internet. These tools for communicating through symbols in new ways enable people to do things together that they weren't able to do before. So in the scribal culture, when there were only a, a few people who knew how to read and write, a few people could really control what people did. When many, many people had access to reading and writing, they began to do things together that changed the, the way things were done. Monarchies became democratic nation states. Science became a collective enterprise. These were things that groups or populations of literate people did. 
The web is what a population of people who knew how to use the internet did. What are we going to build on digital media today? How many people are going to know how to use that to their advantage and in, a, in a, a peaceful and a democratic way, in a way that increases human knowledge? I don't think that those things are guaranteed by the technology. It has to do with the way people use them. Okay, and can you tell us about the literacies you're writing about at the moment? Well, I've been writing for a long time about the intersection of digital media and our minds and our social relations. And most recently, I've become concerned about the amount of literacy. So I wrote about personal computers in the 1980s. I wrote about what are now called social media in the early 1990s. And in 2002, I wrote a book called Smart Mobs about the way people were using mobile devices. And each time I was asked by others, and I asked myself, are these new inventions and the way we use them good for us as individuals, as communities, as societies? And after three decades of thinking about this, I've concluded that the answer is it depends on what people know and how many people know it. In other words, illiteracy. But by literacy, I mean not just the, the skill of encoding and decoding. The alphabetic literacy is about knowing how to read and write. But social media are social. If you are the only person who has the skill of riding a bicycle, you have a bicycle, you're still going to get from place to place faster. But if you're the only person in the world who knows how to read and write, or put a hyperlink on a, a website, then you're, you're not really going to make a lot of use of that medium. It's important to ha have not just the, the skill of encoding and decoding, but to also know how to use media in concert with other people to get things done together. And with the world of digital media and networks we have today, there are a number of different literacies that are distributed in, in a in very varying way. A, f a very few people know a great deal about it, and some people know about some of them, but most of the people online today are not very well literate in the literacies of attention, of critical consumption of information or, or crap detection, in participation, collaboration, and, and network know-how. So that that's been the subject of my most recent work, my book Net Smart, is about those five literacies. And I teach a course at Stanford based on the book about those literacies. I make a lot of videos and blog posts so that others can understand how to use the media we have today. So I think there's a critical uncertainty where we have a, a future in which a few people know how to manipulate many other people, just as we did back in the broadcast era. Well, we have an era in which many people not only have access to the technology, but know how to use it well. And, um, yeah, do you think digital natives are uh, literate in, um, in these new technologies? Well, if you see uh, young people, they all can write texts with one hand behind their back. And my students at Stanford and, and Berkeley are always carrying their laptops. And they're on Facebook a lot. But I found that just because you are of the age in which the use of digital media is very widespread and that you are fluent in a few uses of it, doesn't necessarily mean you know how to use a, a blog to advocate for a cause or you know how to use a, a wiki to, to organize people, or whether you can create a, a digital video that a lot of people will, will see whether you can participate in an online community or organize uh, collective action uh, online or offline. These are all things that some many people know how to do, but it isn't guaranteed by being alive and being 18 years old. Okay, and um, how can you learn? How can you learn? Well, fortunately, people teach each other a lot. So there's a great deal of peer learning that's happening online. If you look at YouTube, Many people turn to YouTube to learn how to do things. And many t people, when they learn how to do things, make a video and put it on YouTube. 
Unfortunately, our educational institutions aren't teaching young people how to search and how to, to determine whether what they find on their search is good information or bad information. Many, many schools don't allow young people online during school hours. So I think our education system, which is really based on transforming agricultural workers into industrial workers for the, the 20th century, uh, now needs to change. And it's a conservative institution, conservative in the sense that schools are about the way things have always been done. It's not really an institution about innovation. That there's really a collision between the speed with which technology is changing the, the world we live in, the knowledge we, we have, the, the, the way we determine whether knowledge is accurate or not. That's happening much more f quickly than educational institutions are changing. So I'd like to see these skills taught in schools, but I also think that people need to begin teaching each other. Okay, so do we need schools in future anymore, if people already start to teach each other? Well, parents are always going to need a place to put their children while they work. And schools, schooling, uh, some educators will tell you, is about teaching compliance. It's teaching how to pe people how to be good citizens in whatever society they're in. So there's a social institution of schooling, but then there's the cultural phenomenon of learning and in a way those are going somewhat in different directions you know you used to have to go to school to learn things now if you've got a smartphone even if you don't have a schoolhouse you can learn things so will people know how to learn things i think that's the the key literacy schools are really mostly in the business of transmitting knowledge they're largely not in the business of teaching people how to learn on their own. And that's what I think we need to do now. We meaning everybody who values digital media and knows something about how to use it. Okay, you have a lot of uh, screens, but you also have a lot of books. Uh, is there a difference um, in learning from the internet and in learning from books? Well, you know, classically, if you're really going to, to drill down and try to understand something, you read a book and you look at the, the footnotes in that book or the bibliography in that book and you go to the library and you try to find that that resource that was cited in the book. Now you can read a text and just cl click on a link and instantly have access to that resource. So the whole knowledge has become much much easier to traverse in terms of a network. You can read a book and then go directly to its primary sources and, and go from there to their sources within a couple of minutes. It used to mean you had to go to the library and you had to get the book out of the stacks. I think the accessibility and speed of knowledge is changing the way people know and the way people learn. And um, also the way they remember. Also, you know, when, when the alphabet came along, uh, Plato warned that people would, would forget the arts of memory. Why memorize things when you can look them up in a book? And now, of course, the, the cloud is our outboard memory. You can search for, for things and, and find the answer. Why do you need to learn it? So uh, I think there are things that it's important to learn. Mostly, it's important to learn how to learn things. But Many, many facts and other things that used to be accessible only in books are now accessible anywhere, anytime, if you know how to search for them. So I think David Weinberger has written a book called Too Big to Know, in which he makes the case that knowledge is much more like a network now. Every piece of knowledge has links to it, has people who agree with it, people who disagree with it, comments on it, tags. There's a whole social world around texts that didn't really exist around books. Sure, you could go to the university or you could correspond with people, but the kind of instantaneous worldwide mass communication about anything that you want to read in a book that's possible on the internet really is only possible on the internet. Okay, thank you very much. Great, good. I hope this is useful to you.